Greetings and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Conversations. I'm Andy Brown. Around the world, big tech has emerged from COVID-19 more dominant than ever. At one point last year, the biggest tech firms accounted for a quarter of the US stock market value. Now comes the backlash. In China, the Communist Party state is reasserting itself against the big tech platforms that threaten its monopoly on power. Jack Ma, the country's richest person, finds himself in the crosshairs of the regulators. Europe doesn't have its own tech giants, but it's taking on the oligopolies of Silicon Valley, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and others in the name of protecting small businesses and the consumer. In the US, meanwhile, the nation is caught up in an impassioned debate about the role of social media giants, the polarizing effect of social media echo chambers, viral misinformation, rampant conspiracy theories have produced a full-blown political crisis. Millions believe Donald Trump's big lie that the US presidential election was stolen. The storming of the Capitol by mobs of his outraged supporters threatened democracy itself. Now arguments are raging over whether Twitter was right to deplatform the US president. Here to discuss all this and more is an all-star panel of experts. Duncan Clark is the chairman of investment advisory firm BDA China, which he founded in 1994. He's also the author of Alibaba, the house that Jack Ma built, which has been published in more than 30 languages. Welcome to the program, Duncan. Thank you. Richard Edelman is the CEO of global communications firm Edelman, which was named PR agency of the decade by both Advertising Age and The Holmes Report. Thank you for joining us, Richard. Thank you for having me, Andy. Karen Kornblu is the senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, leading its digital innovation and democracy initiative. She's also the chair of the Open Technology Fund, a government-funded nonprofit advancing global internet freedom. And she served as the US ambassador to the OECD in Paris during the Obama administration. Thanks for being here today, Karen. Thanks for having me. Catherine Ma is the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit organization that operates Wikipedia and the Wikimedia projects. She has worked with UNICEF, the National Democratic Institute, the World Bank, Access Now on programs supporting technologies for domestic participation, civic engagement, and open government. Welcome to the program, Catherine. Thanks, Andy. I'm joining you today from New York, and I'd like to welcome our global community of Bloomberg New Economy delegates who've attended the forum for these past three years. We also welcome our viewers tuning in on social media and the Bloomberg terminal. There will be opportunities throughout this conversation for real-time input from you, our audience. I encourage you to submit questions in the text box in the bottom right of your screen, and I'll invite you to vote in live polling at the top right of your screen. If at any point you encounter technical difficulties, a simple refresh of your browser should help get things back on track. Now, let's start with an audience poll to see what our viewers think about the social media platform's decision to suspend Donald Trump's account earlier this month. Question, were Twitter and Facebook right to de-platform Donald Trump after the riot he incited at the Capitol on January 6th? Your options are yes, it headed off more violence, no, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey should not be the arbiters of free speech on the internet. It was the right move, but there should be better regulation from government guiding decisions like this. The internet should prioritize uh, freedom with minimal censorship and regulation. While we wait for the audience to submit their answers to the poll, let's get to today's Firestarter interview. Yesterday, I spoke to Mitchell Baker, the CEO and chairwoman of Mozilla, Mozilla Corporation, which operates the Firefox web browser. And I put the very same question to her that I just put to our audience. Take a listen. Mitchell Baker, thank you for joining us. 
My pleasure. Mitchell, I'm going to ask you right off the bat, was it the right decision by Twitter and Facebook to de-platform Donald Trump? The platforms have to do something different than they have been. We've had years of experience of the platforms doing nothing and allowing violence to continue. And so in the moment, the head of state is hard to imagine, but the platforms have to start acting differently. And even if we decide that deplatforming needs different rules and regulations, we have to see it in action and understand all sides of the issue. We have so much experience in the platforms doing nothing. So um, moving into the zone where we can actually see and understand and debate what it looks like when the platforms take action is an important step. Okay, I'm not sure that I heard a yes or a no to that, uh, to that question. Well, you heard an absolute yes that the platforms need to be doing something differently. Uh, and so this was a case where certainly it's hard to imagine standing by um, and doing nothing in this case. You would agree, though, that social media played a big role in the storming of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Well, certainly, all the, the research shows that organizing occurred on social media and uh, earlier than that, that a lot of the extremist, uh, you know, developing of extreme ideas uh, thrives in these places. So, yes. You yourself, in a recent blog post, offered specific suggestions for changes in social media platforms, for instance, in how algorithms amplify content. My question is this, who enforces these new rules? Uh, well, that's clearly uh, the question of the day. That's something that's gonna take some experimentation. I expect in the long run, it will be some combination of the platforms and society, society, i.e. via government and regulation, in understanding what's actually happening. So our proposals were way before deplatforming. A deplatforming is a question of a moment. It's the like the last. It, it's it's after many 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 steps, uh, and so well before that. I mean, even if we decide deplatforming makes sense uh, as a society, you want it to be at the end of a long process, not out of the blue. And so things like what's actually happening, general transparency, who, what are the algorithms, who's targeting them, who's paying for them. These things, if they were available, that kind of information to us, we would be able to understand and make better decisions about, as a society, how much regulation we want and what we're trying to build. The Europeans tend to think that government should take the lead on regulation. What role do you think the state should play? I think the state represents society and should be actively engaged. As an individual citizen right now, for example, what could I do? It's hard to leave Facebook. I mean, I can leave, uh, but others are still tagging me, you know, like all sorts of things are happening. As an individual, there's almost nothing I can do to affect the overall power of the system. That's why we have government. And so I confess that I'm not, I, I wouldn't consider myself of the European view because I think the, the sense that the government knows best and can regulate um, maybe stronger in Europe, but I think the Europeans are actually absolutely right that citizens and society and government have to play a role in the critical infrastructure. Um, that's true with every other industry uh, as they've become important, that there's some role for society. And so I think it's good for the planet and good for all of us that the Europeans and their, their government are looking at these issues carefully. And I would say very thoughtfully, the current, um, draft laws in the EU are really about platform accountability uh, across the spectrum of activities. So there's a lot to learn there. Mozilla's mission, a mission contained in a 2007 manifesto that you yourself personally drafted, is to help create an internet that is open and accessible to all. Is that ideal now, do you think, under threat in the United States? Uh, well, so I think we're probably asking, does deplatforming, uh, if it's ever employed, put that at, uh, at threat? And I would say no. The issue is open and accessible to all means that each one of us should have access and the same ability 
And it shouldn't be only, we'll say, the Western nations or only some race or so, some class or some gender, that each one of us should have the opportunities of the internet. It does not mean that bad behavior or criminal behavior or murder threats or death or rape threats or insurrection or violence should go unanswered. It means that each of us should have the same opportunities and that society as a whole, when we address bad behavior, we should address it equally for all of us. There's people who suffer when there's no deplatforming. We talk about it with Donald Trump, but plenty of people have been cut off of their accounts that we don't know about. And so building the overall system where we're treated equally and we all have the opportunities of the internet and we are all accountable and responsible for our own behavior is a critical part. You can't build a society if people aren't responsible for their behavior. Mozilla is a nonprofit. Firefox, your web browser is open source. It relies on armies of volunteers all over the world, improving the product, localizing uh, uh, some, of, some, of the, uh, some of the software. How should social in media industry balance the need for commercial profit and public good? Clearly the two are now in conflict. Yes. So there's a set of things I think we can learn from other industries. You know, technology is not the only industry or social media where you've got both benefits and, and uh, externalities or significant drawbacks or costs. So I think it's hard to ask the companies to do that alone themselves. Uh, really the way the corporate system is set up, it's really profit driven. And so I, I think there will be some changes that come from the companies, some from the employees, some as the leaders learn more. But I think a lot is going to have to be in concert with either consumer demand for something better and or consumer voice through government, i.e. regulation. Uh, I, I don't know of an industry that we expect to regulate itself. We don't expect, you know, the energy industries to, uh, you know, all regulate themselves, food, tobacco, you know, most industries, you know, that balance between the benefits and what's too much cost for society, society is involved in. So. I do think we'll see some change from technologists over time. Um, you know, the current companies, hard to say, uh, but in connection with um, changing consumer demand, which needs competition and regulation, we'll, we'll need all of those. Are you seeing at Mozilla a consumer backlash to social media and big tech more broadly? For instance, you've got a, a Firefox add-on that blocks Facebook, as you just described it, from tracking your progress uh, around the internet. Is that popular? Are you seeing more take up on that product or does the consumer not really care? Uh, yes. So right now, what we, what we see is more people care. Uh, it's still hard to know what to do and it's hard to get past the sense of helplessness. So the add-on that you described is called uh, Facebook Container. And what it does, uh, you know, obviously when you're at the Facebook site, you know, or if you're adding information, Facebook is gathering that because you're giving it to them. But beyond that, when you travel around the web, uh, Facebook travels with you and they gather information on things you do on sites totally unrelated to Facebook. And so what the Facebook Container does is it stops the latter. Uh, and that is a very popular add-on. And but you know, there's so much in technology, and it's. Uh, it, I think it's. It's a lot to ask consumers to protect ourselves. So we hope people use it. We encourage it uh, to use these kinds of tools. But we think uh, those are just the uh, examples of how the world could be different. Mitchell Baker, thank you for your time. Thanks for your insights. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Mozilla CEO Mitchell Baker for taking the time to join us. I was struck by the phrase she used, a sense of helplessness. Let's take a look at our polling results and pretty overwhelming. 53% uh, um, think that uh, it was the right move to ban uh, Donald Trump from the internet. Um, uh, very few uh, or a quarter think it it, uh, it was the right move, uh, and 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 in all fairness, um, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey themselves uh, were highly ambivalent um, uh, uh, about this uh, maneuver. Um, so, at the heart of the crisis surrounding big tech is the issue uh, of trust. 
Uh, nobody understands this better than Richard Edelman, whose company has been monitoring the shifting perceptions of government, business, and society through its annual Edelman Trust barometer. Three years ago, that barometer pointed to issues around the battle for truth, uh, as they called it, where people selected media that reinforced their view, the so-called echo chamber. This year, the, uh, uh, the review highlighted something called an infodemic. Richard, explain what an infodemic is and how it's led us to this current predicament that we now face. So, uh, Andy, the uh, phrase that we uh, use more broadly is we're declaring information bankruptcy. And it's on the basis that two thirds of people in our 28 countries say that uh, leaders are liars, that in fact, both government and business leaders intentionally deceive them. But even more profound is the low trust in media sources. So you see in this chart that um, every one of the four categories of media has declined substantially in the last two years. You'll see that uh, mainstream media, for example, fell from 65 to about 53. Um, search, not quite as far. Social dragging the bottom at uh, 35. But understand that's a global number across 28 markets. If you look in the Western countries, you're in the low 20s um, for trust in social media. News organizations are seen as biased. Let me give you a few specifics. 60% say journalists and reporters purposely try to mislead us by saying things they know are false. News organizations, 60% say, are more concerned with supporting an ideology uh, or a political position than informing the public. Third, media is not doing well at being objective. Fourth, the media is not doing well overall. 80% agree with that statement in Japan, Korea, Colombia, Argentina, Italy. Again, this used to be a problem simply of, you know, the UK or the US or France or Germany, not any longer. This is a transversal problem across the world because there's just a deep sense that the media has polarized into left or right camps, that it actually is chasing clicks on the basis that it makes biased statements, it therefore creates social heat and therefore more clicks. It's the new business model of the media. So in fact, what uh, most shocked us in this year's study is that information from a company newsletter huh, is more trustworthy than mainstream media and twice as trustworthy as social media. Last point, we are seeing a deep problem with information hygiene. We, we observe that only 25% of people actually check multiple sources, more than 50% share information in a story, even if they haven't checked the source. And so they complain about the problem, but we are the problem. Richard, you draw a straight line between misinformation peddled by government leaders and the spread of the virus. Who were the worst offenders? Who were the models? Well, I'm in country A for that, but you know, in fact, only a third of people in our global study indicated that they're prepared to be vaccinated immediately, one third within a year and one third not at all. And in France, it's 50-50. And so the vaccine hesitancy is completely tied to the uh, disinformation that's come from um, social media in particular. And it's been a fuzziness about um, the uh, degree to which experts are to be believed. Experts saying whether it's hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir or the latest, uh, you know, miracle solution. That's deeply undermined um, belief in, in experts and scientists who've had a drop in their own trust levels, but even more so for government leaders. Government leaders are the lowest ebb we've seen. Now, also, just to point out, trust in tech you know, over the 10 years has slid by about 10 points, but even much more so in the West into the high 50s. Um, it is still the most trusted, but it's actually demised. And we also see that social media trust is um, 30 points below that. So it is the new financial services. How about that? Let me, let me uh, turn to Catherine Ma, the CEO of Wikipedia, which just celebrated its 20th birthday. Uh, uh, Catherine, first, happy birthday. Um, oh, thank you. you. 
You, you've been fighting misinformation and disinformation for two decades as an online encyclopedia. Explain a bit about how Wikipedia works and what specifically went on inside Wikipedia on January 6th as hundreds of voluntary editors assembled uh, uh, to figure out the facts uh, of the storming of the Capitol. How did they reach consensus? Uh, sure. So Wikipedia is a little different than most social media platforms in that it's a purpose-built platform for information uh, gathering and presentation. And part of the way that it works is that people of very different opinions and experiences have to come together to form what is essentially a single source of truth. One version of an article based on citations from the news media, other reliable sources uh, that captures the, the general tone, tenor, context of an event, piece of history, individual, that sort of thing. Um, on January, or yeah, January, January 6th of uh, this past year, of course, we saw something that is unprecedented in our lifetimes, which is a storming of the Capitol. And Wikipedia editors who focus on breaking news events worked to try to document and capture that. Um, I think the conversation that we had in the media in ensuing days about what to call the event. Was it a riot? Was it a protest? Was it an insurrection, uh, you know, sedition? All of these sorts of things was playing out in real terms on Wikipedia uh, as editors looked to sources of information from the press. As you know well, breaking news events are, are very tough to cover. You're on the ground. You don't necessarily have full visibility of what's going on. Uh, Wikipedia works a little bit differently and has the advantage of being able to pull from all sorts of different sources across the press. So if you've got someone standing on the east side of the Capitol and someone standing on the west, we get to pull all of those perspectives in in order to be able to describe an event in more context and greater depth, um, while also having all the same sort of debates about how does one present information neutrally. It was interesting to hear uh, Richard talk a little bit about objectivity. Uh, we don't really use objectivity as a framework in Wikipedia. We use neutrality. Um, coming from the position that you can have many different sides of a story or a perspective, but the goal is not to sort of be objective and present them all. The goal is to be neutral and present them relevant to sort of the preponderance of evidence uh, about any particular event in a way that most people are able to accept the terms of. So it's, it's a very different model, perhaps, than social media and even, even the news media. To get back to the original question, how would you define who should be deplatformed if indeed you think that that is the right way to go? And what speech, if any, do you think should be censored? So I think that um, we would start from the position that it's not so much about deplatforming, it's about enforcing terms of use and sort of conduct policies that all these platforms had. You could make the argument that any of that Donald Trump, certainly, but others have been some of the most egregious flouters of terms of use that offered by these platforms and that the platforms themselves were in violation for a period of time uh, in continuing to host these individuals on their sites. We certainly know that they're not the first politicians to be kicked off. Many politicians in other parts of the world, as Mitchell referred to, have been deep <clears throat> excuse me, deplatformed without recourse. I think from our perspective, uh, I very much wholeheartedly agree with Mitchell that regulation of an industry is, is not abnormal. It's quite consistent with how we handle most sectors in our economy um, and there are appropriate ways to do it. We would encourage, I would encourage that individual platforms should be looking at their terms of use, ensuring that they uh, have provisions that allow for broad political speech, but then draw the line at things like incitement to violence, which is very much in keeping with standards around, uh, you know, our universal rights around freedom of expression pretty much everywhere in the world. The plunging faith in or trust in media that Richard just outlined is a real problem for you, isn't it? I mean, you, you rely on vetted, verifiable sources of, of, of information. Uh, to assemble your pages. How does Wikipedia exist without fact-based media outlets? So it's interesting. I agree with you, Andy. I'll be the first to say we need trust across the entire information ecosystem. That needs to be the institutions of government. It needs to be research entities and bodies, such as our institutes of health, um, as well as the news media. It's incredibly important to a functioning democracy that we have a trusted news media. Interestingly, it hasn't really affected Wikipedia's trust. In fact, our trust has only grown in recent years. Um, we can talk about why that is. I, th I think it's because we take a different approach to how we talk about 
credible information with our readers and with users and some of our incentive structures are a little bit different. Uh, but we are wholeheartedly advocates of a information ecosystem that is trusted, uh, transparent, the fun transparent functioning of these media institutions so that uh, you know, there's, they are building trust with their end users and the support for these critical public institutions, you know, that have really been sort of defunded and delegitimized by, by politicians uh, over, over the course of the last few decades in a way that, unfortunately, as we've seen in a moment of great public crisis, actually can be quite harmful uh, to our overall public functioning. Do you have a ranking of most trusted news sources? Is there a hierarchy that you've developed? How does it work? So Wikipedians work off this idea that of uh, reliable or, or sort of verifiable sources. Um, and the way that they approach this is obviously quite different across different topics. We have everything on Wikipedia from medical information to breaking news events, uh, you know, to information about 18th century um, Islamic arts. So it, you need to be able to be very flexible in the ways that we think about credibility of sources. But we, we generally look at a few things, which is, does this source, is it respected in its field? Um, you know, is it credible? Is it used by professionals? Uh, does it have some sort of editorial process uh, that ensures oversight? And that could be peer review. It could be more traditional editorial overview, such as a, a newspaper, for example. Does it issue corrections when it gets things wrong? Does it have a process of sort of self-auditing uh, and when we apply those sort of standards to any, almost any publication, that, that really allows us to be able to assess in, in a way that lets us change our assessment over time. There have been sources that have been um, essentially blacklisted from Wikipedia, uh, but not, not so much a trusted ranking. I think it's really important in, as our knowledge ecosystem grows and changes that, that we're able to be flexible and critical consumers of information uh, rather than sort of working off strict hierarchies or lists of uh, the fortunes and favors of, of any news publication will ebb and flow over time and, and so will you know the quality uh, we certainly see that even within news publications as to the topics they cover so uh, we i think part of why wikipedia is so trusted is we actually start from the position that our readers are smart we trust them to be critical. Um, we're transparent about the fact that you know, Wikipedia itself is a work in progress. We explain where the information comes from and, and by and large, that seems to work with for, for people. Uh, it's a very different model, as I said, and I, I do think there's a lot to learn there. Karen, I'd like to bring you in here. One of your concerns at the German Marshall Fund is the impact of technology on democracy. A poll conducted over the summer revealed that almost one third of the American electorate would accept, quote, a strong incumbent leader who does not have to bother with Congress and elections. Is democracy threatened? Yeah, it's great, great question and great discussion so far. Um, you know, when I started working on internet policy um, long ago, we had this idea that the internet by its very design was going to enhance democracy, that it was going to give voice to the voiceless and power to the powerless. Um, and instead, what we've seen, as you've been discussing already, is that it's been exploited and used to undermine uh, trust and truth, which are critical inputs to democracy. Um, and, and part of that is uh, that it's grown concentrated, uh, social media has grown up, and yet we haven't updated a lot of the offline norms and standards that we had uh, to deal with our media environment. And so we've got this terrible um, growth of conspiracy theories. January 6th showed us how dangerous those can be, as have the anti-vax uh, sentiments that have grown up, the COVID conspiracy theories, uh, and the kinds of things you're talking about related to elections. So, um, the problem is that that the solution that we keep talking about is really this ex post whack-a-mole um, where you look at the content or the abuser after the fact, after they've abused the terms of service, after they've been given chance after chance, and then we're all uh, engaged in a debate about who should decide if it's true or not a true or offensive or not offensive. Um, that whack-a-mole is just not working. We need to move away from it. And I think we need to look at how to change the incentives of the platforms instead in just the way that car companies, you know, didn't decide to put seatbelts in cars without uh, having their incentives changed so that they, they needed to do that, but it turned out to be good for everybody. And the thing we need to look at here, I think is the, 
gets at some of the things that Catherine was talking about. How do we make sure that the design, not the content, how do we make sure that the design is transparent and allows folks to understand uh, who's speaking, what the news, uh, what the information they're getting uh, is coming from and what purposes it's serving? We're going to get to that a bit later. How to how to change the incentive structures, as 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 you put it. Um, let me ask yeah. you this though: an, an associated problem which we haven't talked about is is political disinformation of the yep. kind that comes from authoritarian regimes. That too threatens democratic cohesion. What have you been seeing on that front during the COVID nineteen pandemic? I'm thinking of Russia, China, uh, China uh, Iran. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And there continue to be um, takedowns on all the platforms uh, of campaigns that are coming from these authoritarian regimes. It's an ongoing problem. Uh, and the same kind of lack of transparency um, that allows uh, domestic conspiracy theorists to spread their in disinformation also allows uh, these authoritarian regimes to spread their disinformation. The lack of transparency in the ad tech market uh, and the fraud there really uh, provides a loophole into the information system. Uh, the ability of outlets like RT um, to spread and bot networks, fake accounts and so on. But what we've seen recently is this, unlike in 2016 where you could sort of isolate what Russia was doing, it's very hard to isolate the um, foreign state provoked disinformation campaign from domestic, and it's very hard to disentangle top-down disinformation from bottom-up. So we've really seen this intermingling of the disinformation campaigns so that it's almost like a call and response. Uh, sometimes the, the uh, foreign actors will pick up on a controversy in the US and blow it up. Uh, sometimes they'll start something. Uh, the, the wildfires in Oregon is an example where it seems that some of the conspiracy theories that, that was, those were being set by Antifa, that those came from abroad, but were amplified here in the US. Let me bring in a question from our audience. This one is from Greg Beyer, who's a macro ESG uh, strategist based in the US. And he asks, should social media platforms have some liability if their users become radicalized using their technology and commit heinous acts? I'll throw that one uh, uh, to the panel. Anybody, anybody like to have a go at that? Karen? Should social I'll media platforms that, have some liability? Yeah, I'll just say that, that folks are talking about this. You know, both Donald Trump and Joe Biden uh, have brought up this issue of Section 230, which is the US law that um, limits the liability of platforms. Um, it's, it, it's in the e-commerce directive in, in Europe. And, um, and now there are various bills in Congress that would sort of surgically narrow Section 230 for different things, uh, allow civil rights uh, complaints, allow civil complaints. Um, if you don't have transparency in your algorithms, you lose Section 230 uh, for content that's shown to violate the law. So there, there are a lot of um, discussion around uh, surgical narrowing of that uh, immunity. But the, the thing that people don't understand, people from the left and the right, who think that getting rid of the immunity is going to solve totally opposite problems is that a liability law in the US is so weak because of our first amendment. It's so hard to sue somebody um, uh, that, that, um, that getting rid of it is not really going to address so many of the problems that we, that we deal with. But there are, there are a number of efforts to reform it. Okay, let's shift to China for a moment. Uh, Duncan. Uh, before we get into antitrust, free speech issues, um, I have to ask you, as the author of the definitive book on uh, Jack Ma, the house uh, that, uh, that uh, Jack built, where is he? Um, I know we've seen him on a video after he disappeared for a couple of months, but what do we know about his circumstances? 
Right. Well, I mean, he built several houses personally, uh, of course, um, so he could be in any number of them. The most recent public sighting that was arranged by uh, official uh, Zhejiang media was in Hainan at a rural education event. That was sort of, we can say, the proof of life, if you will, in terms of that he was not, quote unquote, missing as people like the Daily Mail and others had had fed during the absence of any information. Of course, this was a growing challenge. It still is. I mean, there is still a lot of cynicism and uh, uh, about uh, his location, but there is, I don't think, the same, you know, speculation about him being in the same kind of uh, problems as previous missing billionaires. <laughs> there, has, there has been a few, um, and so I think this is an attempt by the government to really focus this on regulation, anti-monopoly, and specifically in Ant, of course, the financial empire that he he has built, to kind of clip the wings. Of course, because he attacked the Chinese regulators who struck back by halting the listing of Ant Financial, which was supposed to be the biggest IPO uh, in the world. What on earth was he thinking? Yeah, I mean, it's a very unusual speech that he gave. You can look at it uh, with subtitles. Um, and he read it, firstly, which he rarely did. Uh, he's normally the master of improv. He's a stand-up comedian, but he always you know, reads the room. If he read this room, he, I don't know which part of the room he was reading because in front of him were the financial regulators, past and present, uh, and he sort of launched uh, first into international regulation, you know, criticizing uh, the, the banking architecture of you know Basel and so on, and then he kind of went straight into China without really putting a firewall there that you know uh, tempered his criticisms. I mean, so uh, and he sort of talked as though it was a fait accompli that you know the IPO was going to happen. It had already priced it was going to be the largest in the world, etc. But price doesn't mean trading. And so I, it seems like there was a game there to sort of um, forestall some regulation that he knew was coming. And may, he was put up to it or he did it himself. We don't know. But it was a very uh, out of character speech for him and a very expensive one. One of the things I find very interesting is that um, Beijing's pulling of the ant IPO and the subsequent antitrust investigation into Alibaba has found quite a bit of support among the general public. Contrary to popular belief, Jack Ma isn't adored by everybody in China as the champion of the little guy, the ant. What happened? Uh, what's, what's, what's happened to the, to the public perception of, of Jack Ma in China? Well, the first uh, point to make is that unlike, you know, with Edelman survey, it's very difficult to know exactly what the public thinks here. Um, but it's true to say that perhaps uh, over the last few years, there's been a number of issues that have um, dented a little bit his image. I mean, for example, the 996 debate, which is about the, the you know, the 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week uh, that uh, employees of some of these tech companies work. Uh, Jack sort of at one point weighed in and said, well, you know, uh, that's how that's how it's going to be. And, you know, we've seen that affecting a number of tech companies, including just last week, uh, Pinduoduo. So actually, you know, some of it has been over the work, you know, culture. Some of it has been over the, the sheer wealth. Um, but overall, I mean, I think we, we heard earlier about, you know, trust in tech. People in China associate a lot of the benefits in, in certainly in urban and in urbanizing China uh, of the past decade and 15 years, a lot with technology because pre, you know, e-commerce, there were, you know, crummy shops selling expensive things. And, you know, and now, you know, the convenience uh, is so great, uh, just in the e-commerce area. And that has spread a bit to information. Um, now, there's been pushed back and control from the government, for sure. Uh, but generally, I think you have a generally pr more pro-tech population in terms of trying things, embracing things. So it hasn't been as necessarily about big tech, because actually consumers have had generally a good deal. There's been actually subsidy wars from you know different companies like Meituan and Alibaba and others so I don't think it's it's so much about their experience as consumers it may be you know envy it may be resentment of some things he said um, and you know uh, people tiring of it maybe that he was such a hero I mean there were he was almost worshipped actually you know five six years ago so it's definitely yes. uh, it, it's been a bit tarnished yeah mm -hmm. okay let's talk about free speech we, we've heard from Richard about the info demic. How's that playing out in China? Does the Chinese public trust the information that they're getting from state media on the pandemic? Well, um, you know, I was here for SARS, uh, and that actually was the growth of text messaging and broadband subscriptions in response to a desire for more information from other sources. 
um, which has been clamped down over, you know, in various cycles. You know, we're still emerging. I mean, China has pretty much emerged in many, many ways from the worst of the pandemic. I mean, it was not uh, a very prolonged experience. We know a year ago it was a very different conversation. And, you know, the New York Times and the UN had a piece uh, just uh, yesterday about this. But a year ago, you would have never have predicted the sense that there is trust, uh, more trust, in, because of the way the epidemic has been handled, um, or the pandemic, I should say. So, you know, the public health response on its own, uh, strict, you know, which was very criticized at the time, has engendered a sense of, well, maybe they know what they're talking about. At the same time, let's be realistic. I mean, there's no independent surveys to understand how people really think. And we all know one of the delicious, wonderful things about living in China is the amount of cynicism that is expressed one on one. That definitely has been constrained because some of that was previously on Weibo. And we've definitely seen people, you know, kind of wiping a lot of the comments on social media. So it, you definitely feel that social media is much less vibrant. But the healthy lack of trust and cynicism in a way towards stuff that, you know, they don't believe is still there. Um, but how does it express itself? I got to ask you about wolf warrior diplomacy, the use of Twitter by Chinese diplomats throughout this pandemic, channeling their outrage against the West. It seems to have backfired, it has backfired terribly. Why do they persist? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's interesting. You think about the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, you know, in the US, the State Department is, you know, a very senior uh, department, right? And, and the secretary is very senior in, in government. That's not the case in China. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is pretty low down the pecking order. You know, you don't have a representative in the, you know, the standing committee or, the, or the, I think the Politburo and the, you know, at uh, the highest levels, because you know it's dealing with foreigners. You know, it's barbarian management, right? Traditionally, so I think there has been this bizarre sense of trying to compete for favor, and it's been unfortunate because you know otherwise, you know, qualified diplomats have also signed up to this. Um, so you know, we'll see. I mean, there's clearly some discomfort within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs about that uh, on an individual basis, but there's no way um, uh, uh, diplomats can push back. Um, so it's a very unfortunate development of the last year or so. Karen, let me ask you that the, the Chinese Communist Party realized very early that social media was a potent threat. Uh, hence the great firewall, uh, hence the most sophisticated censorship regime in the world. Uh, but uh, the Communist Party has also quite cleverly figured out ways to co-opt social media. It's not all about censorship. It's also about steering the national conversation, sort of somebody put it, twiddling dials, um, twiddling knobs on a control panel. Um, do you think this is going to be a model that will eventually replace the free and open internet? That is going to be a major challenge, I believe, for the administration. So we've been talking about the disinformation disorder. Um, but this issue of this battle for the uh, information space, this contest for the information space vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian regimes and especially uh, China and Russia uh, is really profound. And as you said, it's censorship, it's propaganda, and it's also surveillance um, that uh, the ability to gather all this data, and in China that includes payment data, um, and gather it with very few safeguards and guardrails um, using facial recognition technology, using other technologies that can identify you by your gate. And China's also been uh, selling a lot of this technology to authoritarians and would-be authoritarians around the world, often with the Belt and Road Initiative. So there really is a contest, I think, for what is the future of the internet going to be like and is it going to uh, allow this kind of surveillance censorship and propaganda? And the U.S. is going to have to, I think, work very closely with allies, with democratic allies, to figure out what kinds of framework uh, they endorse and then to really promote it uh, around the world. And China's already engaged in that kind of uh, diplomacy in part through the countries that it's been selling this technology to uh, through the UN, through standard setting organizations, and the US is quite late to the party. Catherine, it, it seems the CCP finds facts threatening. You've been blocked there since April 2019, according to Wikipedia. Um, do you see any prospect of getting unblocked? Um. Time will tell. I think that we take a very sort of 
long horizon view uh, on information. We were blocked in Turkey for two and a half years and we are now unblocked. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, Andy, is the question. Wikipedia has had been on, on accessible in China and unaccessible in China and plenty of people access Wikipedia from within China using VPNs and, and other sort of proxy um, applications. What is great about Wikipedia is that people do edit it from all over the world in Chinese. We've got folks uh, in Hong Kong and Taiwan and in the broader diaspora. And so our, our sort of approach on this one is it's it's going to be there um, for folks who are able to access it when, whether that's now through these other means or, or hopefully uh, at some point in the future. But we don't have any direct line of communication with the decision makers in China and uh, have never been given a clear explanation for, for what the problem is from their perspective. Is blocking a trend around the world? Where else are you blocked? We're not blocked anywhere else that we are aware of at the moment, but absolutely, this is one of the biggest concerns that we have as we look to uh, the sort of the global landscape is this fragmentation of the web that Karen was just de describing is a, uh, the game, it, we're well underway, is how I would put it. Uh, the, the conversations we were having about a free and open internet under the previous administration um, are really sort of OBE or overtaken by events, as they would say. Uh, the These sort of efforts to block and or manipulate and or force uh, social media entities to remove information in order to continue operations uh, are, are very common tactics across, across the globe. And unfortunately, one of the biggest concerns that we're seeing is that uh, this is increasingly a tactic in democratic nations as well. I think this of all eyes are on India at the moment uh, in terms of what we're seeing pressure there uh, to remove information across different social platforms, take down requests and the like uh, under, under the current government. Um, and it, this is the world's largest democracy we're talking about. So we are concerned that these are the sort of trends that we're seeing as spaces close for uh, open expression and inquiry, um, even in countries that we've, we've long thought sort of were representative of the sort of open societies that, that most people prefer to live in. Right. Um, we've only got a few minutes left and we're going to use the time to work together this panel, like, dare I say it, the Wikipedia editing team, to try to reach some kind of a consensus on the way forward. Um, first of all, Richard, um, what is the role, can I ask you, of business in helping to clean up this mess? One of the interesting findings from your recent survey is that actually business is now one of the most trusted institutions in the world. So actually business is the most trusted institution and my employer is even more trusted than that. So my employer is 15 points higher than business in general. My CEO 15 points higher than normal CEOs. It seems to me that on a spectrum, Andy, we could say, okay, you're a brand. Stop advertising uh, on platforms that don't meet certain standards. That's one option. That happened over the summer, as you'll recall, with Unilever and Facebook. Further along the line, you could say, okay, I'm a company. I have a responsibility to educate my employees. And so I'm going to use my own channels as a means um, to uh, help them get certain facts so that they can share in social. Further, you could say, look, it's a responsibility of a company to try to educate its broader community. And for example, Chevron actually has a newspaper in its local market in California, which it operates. Now that's on the furthest end. So in my view, business has a opportunity and a responsibility to help fill the void left by a shrinking media sector. And I mean shrinking in terms of economics, not just in trust. This implies a greatly expanded role for business. Do you see companies increasingly weighing in on issue, political, social issues like racism, inequality, even free speech? Absolutely. We saw it over the summer uh, in the U.S. on issues of systemic racism. Um, and the result of this is substantial increases in trust for brands and companies that stick their heads up and say, what happened in the murder of George Brown is not acceptable in, in, in George Floyd is not acceptable in our society, that we've got to do better. We have an ability um, as a society to make sure that um, these uh, populations are treated fairly. And 
business has to be part of that solution. But also business has to stop just telling one side of the story if it's gonna participate, say the bad and the good about every um, story. Isn't, doesn't taking sides also, isn't, doesn't taking sides, isn't that also a business risk? I think the greater risk is lack of information in a, in a paralyzed society. Again, look at vaccination. It's a job to be done here to um, persuade employees as opposed to smashing your fist down and saying, you will get vaccinated or you won't work at such a co company. It, it's, it's necessary to bring people along. And there's such a lot of disinformation that it has to be countered um, partly by business. Question from the audience. This one from Tamara Singh, who is the founder of Who, What, Where, based in Singapore. She asks, who is best placed to set global standards and supervise uh, big tech? I might add, what should those standards be? Um, who'd, like to, who'd like to have a go at that? Who, what, who is best placed to set global standards? Well, maybe we could start with, with, with uh, Wikipedia. Um, Catherine, what should the standards be? How do you go about setting standards? Well, I think this is really difficult. I mean, there are standards for the responsibilities of business, for example, in upholding human rights and enabling freedom of expression. These are um, business principles that are adopted at the international levels, referred to as the Ruggie principles. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, the, the challenge here is, is actually that government is responsible for protecting its citizens. That's uh, one of the things that I think Mitchell spoke to earlier, especially in the case of democratically elected governments. And one of the things that large tech companies tend to uh, sort of it, take advantage of is the fact that they are cross-jurisdictional and have operations in different countries and move those operations and, and policy setting accordingly uh, in, in their favor. And they're uh, very well positioned with lobbyists uh, to be very influential in, in terms of the creation and setting up those standards. Um, I think Mitchell made this point that it's very hard for consumers to uh, you know, be able to sort of understand the way the technology works in their best interest. And, and this is where we would really call for greater accountability. I think that there are some interesting areas that around sort of market expectations for transparency, institutional investor funds, for example, we'd like to see some more downward pressure on, on what technology companies are doing and how they are um, held to account. We're talking some of the most highly valued uh, platforms on the planet or, or sort of companies on the planet. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a really tricky question. Otherwise, we would have a better answer at this point. Some form of co-regulation or regulation uh, coming out of Brussels and out of Washington would be greatly helpful. Uh, setting those standards well, uh, coming out of countries that are more democratic, helps create models for around the globe, working through international institutions to understand what those interoperability standards are uh, through sort of the appropriate international bodies uh, that, that are used to govern uh, the internet as a whole, um, and the investment and, sorry, the interest and engagement of the capital markets uh, in terms of thinking about what ethical investing looks like uh, is also a, a lever for pressure. Duncan, what about breaking up big tech? That seems to be the direction uh, that the Chinese government, Chinese regulators are heading in now, at least in certain areas uh, of technology. Well, the CCP obviously didn't get the memo uh, that, you know, big tech is bigger than them, right? And uh, I had to laugh when the, the Onion, I think last summer, put out a, a piece saying that, you know, Facebook has decided to break up the US government because it's, it, it thinks it's become too powerful. I mean, that's the kind of thing you know, that, would, that played very well in China. Oddly, we had this bizarre situation of Trump threatening to uh, take down TikTok. And actually, it was TikTok that first took down Donald Trump uh, recently. But anyway, so this is very well understood by technocratic regimes. And we can talk about, you know, democratic and non-democratic technocratic regimes. But basically, government, governments understanding the technology. Uh, TikTok has 100 million users in the US based on algorithms developed you know, here in China. And so I think it's, you know, it's a game of, um, if you neglect this, if governments neglect understanding the technology and, and outsourcing that to companies, um, yeah, you're gonna get uh, results which they may not like. And so in China, there hasn't been, of course, a naivete about the power of technology. We're talking about a Leninist government that understands the power of the printing presses. The printing presses are now algorithmic <laughs> and they know that. And so they're looking to shape. They have other objectives, the economy, you know, uh, projecting soft power and others. So they're, they're trying to use the tool more than just break them. Question for Richard. 
uh, this one from Alexander we Wegner, uh, who's an account director at APCO Worldwide in Saudi Arabia. He says, uh, asks, reflecting on the past four years under the Trump administration and the administration's use of spokespeople, what role should the communications industry play in the ongoing, increasingly partisan struggle over truth? Your own industry, Richard. We have a lot to do um, with the problem. And we have to insist that um, CEOs speak up. And when they do, um, to uh, be straightforward and to be um, insisting that um, there be policy change. Um, you know, I, I think our biggest problem is there was communication without action. And to me, no communication works without substance. And we had a lot of um, show and not a lot of do. And the two need to come together. We're running out of time rapidly. Uh, one last question. Article 19, which is a free speech lobby group, has suggested that platforms should outsource their moderation decisions to non-governmental social media councils, something like the press watchdogs that in many countries hold newspapers to a voluntary code. Karen, do you think this is the right approach? You know, it's, it's interesting to talk about a code. After, the, after World War II, uh, the uh, news media uh, came together in the US and there were separate efforts in Europe to say, how do we ensure that we don't become just instruments of propaganda? And they adopted and codified a bunch of uh, processes that ensured transparency and credibility. So, you know, when you pick up your newspaper at the newsstand or when you used to, you would see a masthead. You can see a byline on the articles. There are codes and standards. They issue corrections. This kind of transparency and ability to understand where the information is coming from uh, is incredibly important to the user, but it's also incredibly important to watchdogs. And I think that's what they're talking about. And we need to see the platforms go from the sort of deceptive design that they've grown up with, which allows outlets to pretend to be news outlets when they're really just, you know, um, content mills or partisan sheets. Um, when, you know, bots are pretending to be human, they need to have, a, a, instead of that kind of deceptive design that allows that kind of activity, they need to have pro-democratic design that has much more transparency, not only for the user, but as is mentioned, for, for watchdogs to, uh, to help users understand what's going on. And that kind of transparency is central to the original values of the internet. It should be embraced. It's unfortunate uh, that we've gone away from that kind of transparency. And I think democratic nations shouldn't see any kind of trade-off between transparency, free expression, and other democratic values. One final question just came in from Anita uh, Berning, Berninger, uh, the director of product marketing at The Shift Network in the United States. Um, Anita asks, how can you protect the First Amendment during this process of determining how to curb disinformation? How do you curb disinformation being spread by media outlets who'd like to have a final a final go at that one disinformation how do you how do you how do you prevent media outlets from spreading it catherine i was wondering if you were going to call on me andy uh well i mean i, I think it's important to recognize that the protection of the first amendment is the government uh is protecting citizens against the application of censorship by the government it is not the um, determination by a private entity to not host someone on their site or have someone on their morning shows uh, or the like. I, I really think that these conversations, I think the point that Karen made around sort of standards and transparency are tremendously important. Uh, we have had already conversations around sort of regulatory authorities. I think that again, the media, I'm really grateful she brought up this question of media watchdogs um, and sort of the civil society sector that enables some of these accountabilities. And again, I'm just going to also come back to like, there is an investor responsibility here. We're, we're talking to Bloomberg New Economy. Um, these are platforms that are the most highly capitalized, most highly valued in our markets. And there's a responsibility uh, for investors to say, you know, what are the standards and expectations? 
expectations we have around sort of ethical um, comportment of these companies right. in the same way that we hold um, you know extra the extractive industries or the financial sector to have some degree of regulation disclosure and reporting so uh, that's I think where I would leave it Richard final final word to you what is the single most important thing that media should do to restore trust get back to our reporting from um, just following tweets and also make sure that it's fact as opposed to opinion and try and bring um, the two sides back together to to pursue business models based on going to the uh, edges is deeply destructive to democracy thanks Richard that sounds good to me just just the fact just the facts thanks to all of you who have shared thoughts and questions in the Q&A box we'll get uh, um, I'm, I'm so sorry, we're gonna, we're gonna have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Duncan Clark, Richard Edelman, Karen Cornblue, and Catherine Ma. Thank you again for joining us today. We're grateful for your participation and your perspective. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Mozilla's Mitchell Baker for taking the time to join our conversation and to our audience, both within and beyond the Bloomberg New Economy community. Thank you for joining us. You can follow the conversation with at New Econ Forum on Twitter or like us on Facebook. And don't miss coverage of what to expect in 2021. Bloomberg's The Year Ahead virtual event is live this afternoon from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time with interviews with the CEOs of Hyatt and Carnival Corporation. Visit BloombergLive.com for more details. Thank you and stay well. Mm -hmm.